Lord, we do ask right now that you would calm our hearts, our souls, and our minds before you. And we pray that we would draw courage from Scripture. May we draw fortitude from Scripture. May we draw, Father, boldness from Scripture that we might live as the men and women that you've called us to be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. I was listening to a podcast recently when the two hosts on the show got into a little debate. They were talking about a certain Yiddish word. When one of the guys in the, the, on the podcast, he went off on this just rabbinic rabbit trail talking about the word. He started explaining that it comes from this Hebrew word and that it has this link to the Old Testament and that it's all sort of rooted in the Torah. And he went on and on giving the history and the background of this word. And his co-host sort of interrupted him and said, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I knew you were Jewish, but I didn't know you were like super Jewish. <laughs> and his friend said, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really not. He said, I guess you just pick up on a few things from your bar mitzvah or whatever else, and it just kind of sticks with you. And the friend replied, he says, well, y- you know, I, I, just, I just didn't know that about you. I didn't know that you knew all of this. He said, can I ask you, he said, are you, are you seriously devout? Like, are, are, are you deeply and actively Jewish? And the guy sort of sheepishly replied. He says, well, I guess at one time I was. But honestly, right now, these days, I'm really just Jewish enough to make my mom happy. You know, there's probably a lot of people who are sitting in pews today who have a, a faith like that. Maybe they go to Sunday school or they come to a worship service and they they do it in the hopes that it just sort of appeases someone else. I suspect there's probably at least one man here today that you don't mind being here, but honestly, you're, you're really here because it makes your wife happy. I'm sure there's more than one teenager in here. If you had your choice, you wouldn't be here. But you know that it makes mom and dad happy. Now, there's nothing wrong, of course, with having your spouse's approval and nothing wrong with having your parents' approval. Those are very good things. But this morning, as we come to our chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, we are reminded that the real question is not about your spouse's approval or your parents' approval. The real question is whether or not your faith has God's approval. The real question is, is God happy with your faith? Because it may be that mom and dad are happy, and it may be that your spouse is happy, it may be those around you are happy, but God is quite unhappy. As we said, Hebrews 11 is one of the most famous chapters in the book. It is often called the Hall of Faith. It is a well-documented history illustrating the kind of faith that receives the very approval of God. Now, why do I say it that way? Because that's how the author says it in this chapter. This is the idea that sort of holds this whole chapter together. I'll show it to you. Notice in chapter 11, look at verse 2 where he says, For by it, that is by faith, the men of old, what? Gained approval. And then skip ahead to verse 39 at the end of the chapter. It says, And all these having what? Having gained approval through their faith. So the, the bookends for, for the hall of faith, the sort of entrance and exit to this hallway, the beginning and the end is, this is not just anybody, any kind of faith like a, like a golden corral buffet, you just pick what you want. No, no, no. This is a picture here of, of the kind of faith from beginning to end that is approved of by God. 
God saw these men and women. He saw their faith. He saw how they lived. And he gave them a big smile and a big thumbs up. If you were here last week, you know we ended chapter 10 with him saying, quoting from Habakkuk, he says, there's a kind of phony faith that will be judged by God. But he says, there's also a kind of living and active faith that the righteous shall live by faith and they will be rewarded by God. And so the author here wants to inspire his church, and likewise God wants to challenge us this morning to to have that kind of faith, to pursue the right path of faith that is pleasing and will be rewarded by God and approved of by Him. Now, anytime you talk about faith like this, of course, it sparks the question, what is faith? And the author does us a great service. He defines it for us in chapter 11, verse 1. Notice what he says there. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Contrary to popular belief, faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not simply wishful thinking. Faith is not irrational religious optimism. Faith is trusting. Faith is reliance. Faith is a sure perception of those hidden things that God has given us a glimpse of. It is confident action on the basis of God's character and God's word. Notice verse 1, he describes this, he speaks of what is hoped for and what is not seen. Now now listen to me closely, we live in a, a visible, tangible, you can see this pulpit, tangible, a visible, tangible world, right? Well, the Bible's contention from beginning to end is that overlapping this visible, tangible world is an invisible, intangible world. And just as real as this world is, that world is equally as real. And so some things that we hope for, some things that are not seen, it's be, the reason they're that way is because they're either spiritual or they are future. And so faith is confidently living as if those spiritual things are real, as if those future things will come true, as if all of this that is intangible and invisible will one day make an effect on that which is tangible and visible. My favorite living preacher is a man by the name of H.B. Charles. He says it this way, Batter in the bowl is the substance of hope for cake. Batter is not cake, right? But it's the stuff that tells you cake is on the way. You don't see cake yet. Now, wishful thinking sees an empty bowl and expects cake. That's stupid. Faith-filled thinking sees the batter in the bowl. It doesn't see the cake, but it sees that the cake is coming. It sees the batter. It understands the substance of what's there and understands that you don't start cramming your mouth full of other things to ruin your appetite because cake is on the way. You make a choice now based on what you see because of what's coming. That's faith. The conviction of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our God is not a visible God, but He is a very vocal God. He's not seen, but He's been heard. And faith is rearranging your life and your schedule and your plans and your conversation and your parenting and your career and your to-do list around what God has said, even if what God has said is invisible, spiritual, and future. You plan your life today around the substance that you have, knowing what's on the other side. 
And that's precisely what the men and women of this chapter did. And when they did it over and over and over, they did, there were things that they saw a little bit, but they only saw the, the substance. They knew that beyond there was something to come, but they made choices today that changed their life. And when God saw how they lived, He gave each and every one of them the heartiest of approval. So that's what we're after. God-approved faith. So what does that look like? Could we be added to this list? Could your life be defined like this? That's the question for every one of us this morning. So I want to go through this passage here, and I want to kind of group these little biographies and show you what I think are some themes, some lessons that he's trying to teach us about what God-approved faith is looks like. No, notice the first indication of a God-approved faith. What, 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 how do we know that it's true in our life? It happens, first of all, when you trust what God says, despite what you see. You trust what God says, despite what you see. And he shows us that in verses 3 through 12, and he makes his way with this definition of place, showing us here's what God-approved faith looks like. Now, he's going to give a bunch of examples here, but it's interesting. His first example here is not Moses or Abraham. His first example, believe it or not, is you and me. Look at verse 3. By faith, we... See that? We understand. Faith is not just a buried treasure for ancient people to enjoy. Faith is something for you and me today, he says. By faith, we understand. Now, those four words alone can be an entire sermon. Because we live in a world, listen, that's trying to tell you and convince you that you have to choose between reason and faith. You, have to, you can be a man of science or you can be a man of God, but you can't be both. My friends, the, the Bible is quite clear. Listen, Reason and faith are not at odds with one another. Christianity is not about reason versus faith. It is about having a reasonable faith. Even about the most basic questions of life. Like what? Like where we come from. So look at verse 3. For by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So he tells us here, by faith, our understanding of the origins of all that exists, that's where it comes from. We understand this by faith. The worlds, he says, were prepared by God's Word. Genesis 1, what do we see there? We, it tells us how God made stuff. What did God do? It says, then God said, and then God said, and then God said, and then God said. God spoke and stuff came into existence. He said light and there was light. He said trees and there was trees. He said duck-billed platypus and this weird thing popped out. He spoke things into existence out of nothing. He didn't make it from the things that are. He made it out of nothing. Now, some people hear that and they think it's absurd. But listen, when it comes to the origins of the universe and this question here, it, in some sense it is a question of science, but it really is a question, honestly, of history. We know what we know about history from those people who were there. Now, listen to me. None of us were at the Battle of Waterloo but we believe certain things about the Battle of Waterloo. Why? Because people who were there told us what happened at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, how many of us were there at the beginning of the universe? None of us. We weren't there. Bill Nye wasn't there. Charles Darwin wasn't there. Only one person was there, and that's God. And God told us that He created all things by the power of His Word. And so He says, by faith, we understand where everything came from. We don't see it, right? We weren't there to watch it with our eyes, but we trust God's word. Verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Skip down to verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. So he moves on then to two examples, two men, Abel and Enoch. Now, if you know the story of these two men, it's interesting that he picked them here because their lives serve as polar opposites, right? Abel had faith, and he died. Enoch had faith, and he didn't die. 
He places before us the lives of these two men who they had different outcomes, but both men were living by faith. So listen, when you live by faith, it doesn't mean that your life is going to follow the same trajectory as the person next to you. God will deal with you as He wants to deal with you. It may be the path of Abel, it may be the path of Enoch, but either way, we're called to live by faith. And when we do that, it's pleasing to God. Now, why is that important? Verse 6, because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, folks, he does not say it's difficult to please God without faith. He doesn't say it's hard to please God without faith. He says it is impossible to please God without faith. Verse 6 tells us that is the key. We have to believe, as one scholar puts it, we have to believe not only that God exists, but also that God cares. That He knows who we are when we respond to Him and He will reward us for seeking Him. I think the meaning of verse 6 is pretty simple. I think it teaches us that faith honors God, therefore God honors faith. Faith honors God, therefore God honors faith. We move from creation to Abel to Enoch. Notice verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned by God about what? Things not yet seen. Alright? In other words, he hadn't seen it with his eyes. But in reverence, Noah prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. Now notice again, he's stressing the idea. You didn't see creation. Abel had never seen the tabernacle with its sacrificial system. Enoch, everybody he ever saw died. That's that's what he was used to seeing. And here he says, Noah, there were things that he had not seen. He'd never seen a flood. He'd never seen a big old boat like that. He'd certainly never seen animals line up two by two. But what? He heard the promise, the word of God. He was warned by God. And so based upon what he knew in God's word, Noah rearranged his entire family life around God's word. For 50 years, Noah planned and designed and preached and warned and built and dedicated his life to this legacy, this one project, all on the simple basis that he believed what God said was true. Think about that. He had not seen it, but God told him. So he said, okay, God, I'll trust you. Of course, the greatest such picture comes from Abraham, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, called by who? By God, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, verse 8, not knowing where he was going. Again, implying what? He couldn't see where he was going. Abraham, God did not give Abraham a map. God did not give Abraham GPS. But God gave Abraham something better than a map and something better than GPS. He gave him a promise. He gave him his word. And so not seeing where he was going, didn't even have a road sign. He just started walking because God said walk. And so he put his faith not in what he could see, but in the word of God. It wasn't just Abraham, the same with Sarah. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. When Sarah looked down at herself, she saw her wrinkly skin, she saw her gray hair, she saw her postmenopausal barren womb, and what did she do? Initially, she laughed. Because that's ridiculous. Based on what she could see, this was not going to happen. And yet there came a point, it says, when she considered him faithful, who had promised. And so biologically, medically speaking, what Sarah saw was the inability to conceive. But by faith in God's promise, what Sarah saw was grandchildren. My friends, do not let your eyesight rob you of the exciting adventure called living by faith. All of those people, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, they trusted God despite what they could see. The conviction of things not seen. A few weeks ago, you know, we had the solar eclipse. 
and we were talking about with our kids, and we, I'd kind of watched the clock, and I said, all right, the, it's, the eclipse is out, let's, let's go out there. And so the youngest kids, they said, so we just look at the sun? And I said, no, 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 don't, don't just look at the sun. They said, why not? I said, because it's, it's still really dangerous. I said, you have to wear these, those, these glasses. And they said, oh, and so we gave them the glasses, and they looked up, and they, oh, you know, they were just giggling and laughing, and it was the greatest thing. Now, we all know those glasses did not put the moon in front of the sun. Right? The moon was already in front of the sun. But the glasses enabled them to see it. Likewise, we are to put on faith. And when we put on faith, it enables us to see with the eyes of our heart what you cannot see with the eyes in your head. Faith allows you to glimpse of the supernatural world which will shape how you think about this natural world. As Corey Tim Boone once said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Abel did it, Enoch did it, Noah did it, Abraham did it, and Sarah did it. The question is, will you do it? At the end of each day, which weighs heavier on your mind? What you see or what God says? When the fridge is looking empty, is your first thought, we're going to starve? Or is your first thought, God's going to provide? One is living by sight, the other is living by faith. Listen, God may not be calling you and your family to do something crazy like build a giant boat in your backyard. But guess what? He might be calling you to do something even crazier, which is like move your family to Pakistan or India. And those around you may think you're crazy, but guess what? When we're called to live by faith, we trust God's word more than what we see. So God approves of that. That's not all. He also approves, number two, when we look beyond death to what lies ahead. When we look beyond death to what lies ahead. Now notice how verse 13 starts. It says, all these died in faith. Now there's a little theme that's tucked in here that's really, it's easy to miss it. But in this little section here, he's going to pick up on this idea of death. Believe it or not, this is a great funeral passage if you want one. In, 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 in verse 13, it says, all these died in faith. Skip down to 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, what? Offered up Isaac. What does that mean? He tied him down to an altar and he raised a knife because why? He was going to kill him because God told him to. So Isaac was going to die. Look at verse 19. Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from what? The dead. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob... As he was dying, verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying. You see the theme in this little section here? He's saying here, he goes back to Abraham and back to Isaac and to all the patriarchs, and he says every single one of them was confronted with death, and yet in the face of death, they looked beyond it to what lies ahead. Now, in verses 13 to 16, there's this interesting little interlude here. That if if you didn't like the definition of verse 1, if it left you unsatisfied what faith is, he's going to define it again. He's going to take another run at it. So look at verse 13. All these died in faith. Now he's going to define faith. Without receiving the promises, but having, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For He has prepared a city for them. He says, those who live by faith realize that they are pilgrims and foreigners, no matter what country they're in. They they realize that they don't really fit in with this group or that group completely because they're part of a totally different group. They might identify a little bit with that group and a little bit with that group and a little bit with that group, but nothing really feels right because this, this world is not our home. They're looking beyond it for something else that is to come. Let's be honest, for some of us, the life of faith is difficult, not because we don't have affections for God, but we have stronger affections for this world. He says here, no, no, they they look beyond that. And so knowing all of that, this is how they live. 
Abraham when he took Isaac up to sacrifice him. Look at verse 19 again. It says, he considered that God is able to what? To raise people even from the dead. Now think about that. It says that Abraham considered. It's quite literally Abraham had to stop and think about this thing for a second. It's not that he chucked thinking. But the the, the point of Abraham's thinking here is the fact that God said two things that for most of us would cause a problem. On the one hand, God said, Isaac is going to give you grandchildren. And the other hand, he said, kill Isaac. And our response, naturally, would it not be, okay, God, there's a contradiction there. Abraham looked at that. Isaac's going to give you grandchildren. He looked at that, kill Isaac. And Abraham went, huh. I guess God raises people from the dead. Because we say, well, that, that has to be true or that has to be true. They can't both be true. And Abraham said, no, no, God said it, so it must both be true. So there has to be a third option somewhere. So he looked at death and he raised the knife as if to kill his own son. And what? He says, well, I, I'm going to do this by faith because God told me he's going to give me children, grandchildren, so therefore he's going to trust God. Not only Abraham and Isaac, look at verse 20, by faith, Isaac, when he grew up, he blessed Jacob, his son, and Esau, even regarding things to come. So again, Isaac knew how to look beyond what was in front of him. By faith, 21, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. In other words, while they were still in this life right now, they were thinking about what was going to happen after they die, both here on earth and even beyond. There's a sense in which you can just see here uh, Jacob and Joseph as they're dying on their deathbed, calling their family near and calling their children near and calling their grandchildren to their bedside and them speaking to them and saying, listen, kids, grandkids, understand, in a little while I will breathe my last. In a little while my heart will stop. But I know these two things. In a little while I will be dead. I also know that God will not be dead. So even though I'm gone, there's still more to come. God's promises aren't finished. They don't die off with me. Parents, are you training your children to think like that? Does your children's faith totally rest wholly independently in you? Or are you teaching them to trust God for themselves? To say, look, even when I die, God's still at work. God's still doing something. There is life beyond death and we should look towards that. All of these men were staring death in the face and yet they continued to trust God, clinging to His promises. A while back I came to the intersection up here. If you know 811 and 221, there's that, 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 that intersection, that T-stop. And I stopped and I was looking out the windshield across the, the field there and I just sort of said out loud, I said, man, that is beautiful. And one of my children was sitting over here, one of the younger ones, and he said, what, the traffic? And I said, no, no, no. I said, pass that. And I kind of pointed and he said, the cows? I said, no, 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 buddy. Look, 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 look. See the blue, we call it the Blue Ridge Mountains. You see the mountains? Now he was looking, but he wasn't looking far enough. Isn't that the challenge for most of us? We look out to tomorrow, we look off to next week, we look to next month or next year, but we're not always thinking right now in light of what lies well beyond. That's what Abraham was doing. That's what Isaac was doing and Jacob and Joseph. And that's what God has called every single one of us to do. My friends, not only am I a preacher, but I'm also, believe it or not, a good fortune teller. I don't own a crystal ball, but I can tell you your future. You are going to die. I've been saying that for 11 years and so far, I am right every time. You are going to die. Now, that might make you uncomfortable. The the, the question is, if that prospect frightens you, that tells you something about your faith. If that prospect keeps you awake at night, that tells you something about your faith. 
Listen, we should be able to say along with the psalmist, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the shadow of a knife cannot cut us, and the shadow of a gun cannot shoot us, and neither can the shadow of death intimidate us who've put our faith in God. He's overcome the grave. He's taken the sting out of it. So we look beyond death. Christians should not have a death wish, but we shouldn't have a death phobia either. Brothers and sisters, listen, if you die tomorrow, you'll be with Jesus. If you don't die tomorrow, Jesus will be with you. Where's the downside? Now, listen, there are some people in this room, and I mean this quite literally, who are staring death in the face. There are people in this room. I have sat at your bedside. I have come to your homes. I have prayed with you. People who have tumors and cardiac issues. People have major health problems. I understand that. And that's why the message is so urgent. Listen to me. Just because you have cancer in your body doesn't mean you have to have a frown on your face. Just because you have heart problems doesn't mean you also need to have a faith problem. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said, what? Do you believe this? That's the question. Do you believe this? Abraham looked beyond death. Jacob looked beyond death. As did Joseph. The question is, have we? The third lesson here of a God-approved faith are those who fear and obey God rather than men. How do you know your faith is approved of by God? Because you fear and obey Him rather than men. Now notice this next section, verses 23 to 31, he's got another little theme he draws on, and that's the issue of fear and obedience. Look at verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. If you remember, that's Amram and Jochebed. And why did they hide him? Because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were what? Not afraid of the king's edict. So they knew what the, what the king had said. They knew what Pharaoh had said. But they said, you know what? I, I, I know that's something we should be afraid of, but I really understand that there's somebody else we should be more afraid of. They passed that lesson on to Moses. Look at verse 29. By faith, Moses, when he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is what? Unseen. So once again, Moses here, if anybody knew the power of the king, if anybody knew, had a reason to fear Pharaoh, if anybody had a reason to, 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 to obey what Pharaoh said, it was Moses. He grew up in his home, and yet Moses says, you know what, I understand what Pharaoh is saying, and I understand the king, but I have a greater fear for someone else. He wasn't alone. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Joshua and the Israelites, they came to the walls of Jericho and they what? They, they didn't set dynamite or TNT around the edge of the building, what, of the walls. What did they do? They marched around it. That's what God told them to do. And they probably looked crazy to the people of Jericho. They probably mocked them and ridiculed them. They probably taunted them and laughed at them day after day as they walked around and they're obeying this seemingly ridiculous commandment of God and they continue to do it day after day after day. But my friends, listen to me closely. It is better to look crazy and obey God than to look sane and normal and disobey God. Joshua feared God and obeyed Him. There's somebody else who did too inside Jericho. By faith, 31, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Rahab knew about the Gentile gods that she worshipped, but now she got a glimpse of the true, one true and living God. Both Joshua and Rahab believed that God's power was real and they believed that God's promises were certain. Therefore, they feared God and obeyed Him rather than men. That's what they all did. Amram, Jochebed, Moses, Joshua, Rahab. They feared God. The issue in this little section here is the question of allegiance. I know we normally say that word when we put our hands over our heart and we look at the flag. Certainly as Americans, we pledge our national allegiance 
to our country. But as Christians, we pledge our ultimate allegiance to our Savior. And church, listen to me very closely. We must never switch those two. Never. Amram and Jochebed and Moses are a reminder there is a time and place for God's people to engage in civil disobedience. I'm not talking about being unruly because you don't like the speed limit. That's not what I mean. I'm saying our highest loyalty is not to Pharaoh or a king or a president or a congress or a supreme court. Whenever the laws of men set themselves up against the laws of God, we better stand with Peter and the apostles who said in Acts chapter 5, we must obey God rather than men. Listen to me closely. Circumstances will not lead you to that brave decision. And comfort will not lead you to that brave decision. Only faith will lead you to that brave decision. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress and a Baptist pastor who was arrested many times, he once said, quote, I will stay in prison until the moss grows on my eyelids rather than disobey God. Because Bunyan feared God more than man. The fear of God puts all other fears in their place. My friends, if God is for us, who cares who's against us? All of these men and women, they fear God more than man. Do you? In your workplace, in your high school, in your neighborhood, in your conversations, is it evident that you fear God most? The final notation here that we have is that how do you know your life is approved of, your faith is approved of by God? Well, number four, it's those who count on God's victory in life or in death. Count on God's victory in life or in death. Notice verse 32. He says, and what more shall I say? I love this. This is a great preacher moment. He had just spent 29 verses giving them examples of faith from two books of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus. He started with creation, worked all the way through Moses, 29 verses. And now he says, I have just barely started to preach, folks i got 37 more books of the Old Testament if you want me to do it. What more shall I say? He, he goes on and tries to now cram it all in like I'm doing. He says, for time will come if I tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David, of Samuel and the prophets. It's a who's who of, of Old Testament leaders, judges and kings and prophets. If you go back and read every one of these men, they faced overwhelming odds against them, and yet they trusted God for deliverance and for victory in this life. And many times God came through. Look at verse 33. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, 35 women received back their dead by resurrection. Now that is quite a list. By faith, God enabled these men and women to overcome their enemies in dramatic fashion. Simply put, now listen to me closely, by faith, they saw miracles. What else do you call shutting a lion's mouth? What else do you call single-handedly defeating an army? They saw miracles. And this is a very exciting part for them of the Christian life. As a church, we've seen God do this. We've seen God perform miracles, protecting our missionaries. There's people sitting here today that you got a, 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 a terminal notice from your doctor. You got six months to live, and here you are sitting years later. And people, we, 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 as a church, we have seen God work miracles in many different ways, and we see those victories. But let's be honest, that's not all there is, because verse 35 says, and others, this is the other side of the coin, were tortured, not accepting their release, so they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Now, I have yet to hear a prosperity preacher use that text for his sermon. 
The Bible has no problem with the idea that God blesses and prospers people. The Bible has a problem with the idea that God only blesses and prospers people. It's okay to have a little prosperity and health in your theology. You need to have a little poverty and sickness, though, too. The life of faith, it may bring you before a king's throne, but look, it may also bring you before a king's guillotine. For 2,000 years, the world has been throwing Christians into coliseums and chaining us to dungeons and tying us to the stake and putting the cold metal barrel of a gun to our heads and the world has repeatedly told us to deny Him, to deny Him, to deny Him. And my friends, in that moment, faith is the only thing that will give you the courage and the clear-mindedness to prefer torture to compromise. It is only by faith that you could make such a decision. We should pray for the persecuted church and the imprisoned church. We should pray for them to have freedom, but even more, we should pray for them to have faith. It's good for Christians to have freedom, but it is essential that we have faith. The last section here teaches us, listen, God is victorious in every miracle, and He is victorious in every martyr. Every triumph reminds us of God's power and every tragedy drives us into God's promises. Sometimes your faith is going to bring you to a moment that will figuratively take your breath away and others it may bring you to a moment where it will literally take your breath away. But what did Paul say? Romans 14, if we live, we live unto the Lord and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, guess what? We are the Lord's. There is victory in life and in death for those who live by faith. Job was right. Sometimes the Lord gives. And sometimes the Lord takes away. And only those who live by faith could then say, either way, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. For this reminder to live by faith. And Lord, we ask that we might be named among this list as as those who confidently look to you. And Father, we pray that you will bless now as we eat and drink together. That we would do so by faith and honor your son in whose name we pray, amen.